Hey, Deserving Listeners, let's continue watching the Jonah Hill documentary on Netflix called Stutz. It's about therapy. Let's watch. Just do that pyramid. Everything else seems to fall into place. It will. Everything else will fall in place. Now, that kind of certainty is not my style. Now, maybe for him, he really believes this stuff, and it's true for him that following this model always works. But technically speaking, as therapists, we need to avoid those kinds of statements because they're unscientific. To say that this always works is not supported by the science. You can't demonstrate that. And if you did research it, I would guarantee you that would not pan out. There's no treatment that is even near 100% effective. So we shouldn't be saying things like that. We can say things like, in my experience, it often works, if not always. In fact, I'll, I will say things like that, but I will never say this always works. Now, I might be guilty of that at times. You know, I yammer a lot into this microphone and well, in front of this camera. So I'm not going to say I've never had that problem. But if I did, that's a problem. You know, if I give the impression that somehow something always works, you know, then now there are some universal things like general things, right? Like pay attention to your body and your needs will always be beneficial and better for you than the alternative, right? Well, but even then, I don't even know if I would say that, right? Because instantly these asterisks under special circumstances creep into my mind. So anyway, I just want to point that out. And when I hear someone say that, it raises red flags because when therapists fall in love with their model and especially, and he hasn't done this yet, but if they say things like, I, my particular model is different from everyone else's. And when they straw man everyone else as this universal other thing, when it's just like, how do you encapsulate all of their therapy under one umbrella, which is just ridiculous. And especially like when I was reacting to Teal Swan, she did this in her videos. And if you know about her, she's a non-clinician, charismatic leader, some say cult leader, I don't know. She was saying that, that like, she is the only person who can help you with your issues. And that is a cult leader. That's a liar. Now they might narcissistically believe that about themselves, but it's a, a huge red flag. Now, might someone still be helpful? You know, if I had a therapist that I really liked, and he said something like that, like, my model is the best and everyone else sucks. I might in my head go, well, that's a red flag and that's not true and that's stupid, but I really like your model, so I'll continue to do it. <laughs> so I'm not saying those individuals can't be helpful, can't, can't be helpful, but you just have to know that that's just not true. And it's a red flag. It, it's a red flag of narcissism. It's a red flag of not understanding science. It's a, it's a red flag of not understanding the research, not being familiar with the research. It's a red flag of being further and further away from education and the standard of care. You know, it's a red flag of unethical behavior because I've seen it before. People will fall in love with their ideas and narcissistically believe that they have this special thing and that everyone else is an idiot. And thus, ethics they don't apply to them because they're they're above it. They don't need to follow the ethical codes because they have a special understanding of how humans work. And those idiots that don't understand things can't tell me what to do because I, I, I know better than that. And then they start doing things like having sex with their clients. Yeah, it, it happens. I'm not saying, I, I don't think that's happening here, but you know, I, I just want to say that, that you, you, you got it. With the increasing amount of charismatic individuals online, some of which are therapists. If you ever hear that, you should really go, oop, what's going on with this person? They would walk out the same way they walked in, feeling like shit and basically hopeless. So I said to him, is there anything we can do so that they can feel better, feel something at least sooner? And the guy, the, the guy says to me, don't you dare, he says. It was like somebody who fundamentally didn't understand yeah, right. So I suspect that he had a bad supervisor because good psychoanalytic supervisors will be able to field that question in an effective, convincing way. There are many, in, particularly in contemporary psychoanalysis, relational psychoanalysis, there's a lot of activity that these, psycho, these psychoanalysts analysts will engage in. But I'm guessing that he came from one that didn't really understand or wasn't very convincing or something and said... You don't insert yourself and you need to be a blank slate for people to free associate so because we understand that that always makes them get better and by the way 
science does demonstrate that free association, or at the very least, self-exploration, is associated with positive outcomes. So it's not as if elements of psychoanalysis have been completely debunked. A lot of, some of it has, depending on how we look at it. You'll, you'll read online people like, uh, psychoanalysis has been debunked. It's a bunch of pseudoscience. And it's like, when I hear stuff like that, it's like, you, you obviously don't understand, one, what psychoanalysis is, because to describe psychoanalysis even in a paragraph is impossible. Also, there are contemporary versions of it that have very little, well, the foundation might have something to do with Freud and neo-Freudians, but they incorporate, you know, my conceptualization of cutting edge psychoanalysts today is they're, they're fairly humanistic and may or may not accept that about themselves. <laughs> anyway, because in the past, the psychoanalysts and the humanistic people hated each other. H humanistic psychology emerged in opposition to psychoanalysis. A lot of therapies, you know, systemic family therapy in opposition, cognitive behavioral therapy was in opposition to psychoanalysis because the, they were the dominant uh, group of people. So there's a lot of misinformation and anger and resentment within the schools. Anyway, so he's talking about when he was first starting out that he had clients and he was doing the model as he understood it. The clients are talking and he's not intervening at all. He's just listening, right? And he goes to the supervisor is like, is there anything that I feel like I want to do something with them? And the supervisor says, no, like you got to stay out of it, right? And then he's like, I don't think I like this form of therapy, and I wouldn't either. That, that's, you know, the style of therapy that I, if we're on a spectrum of a particular dimension of activity and therapy, for example, and you have his supervisor over here, which I believe is traditional psychoanalysis, and we have, you know, Phil Stutz over here or something, I, I'm, I'm very close to Phil. I, in terms of activity, I might be the same as Phil Stutz, I don't even know, but just, I think, in a different style of a way, right? I didn't want people walking out of my office with nothing. Did you ever worry with that strategy you'd give them the wrong piece of action? No. I, in this area, I'm, I, as I say, always say, I'm just a regular person, nothing unusual except for this. I zoom in on you and I block out everything else. Since I was a little kid, people... So this is another red flag. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. We'll hear more of this, but Jonah is saying, okay, that impulse that you have to give them a tool or to give advice or to tell them what to do, do you ever worry that it's the wrong thing? And he immediately says no. And at first I'm, I'm a little, because huh, no therapist should say that about their interventions. That is very irresponsible for a therapist to say, I'm always right. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious, right? Uh, no. We're often wrong, and that's okay. You can, but you have to frame it as such. It's like, and it's tentativeness, right? That's what I always try to do anyway. I'll be, I don't know, maybe if you tried this, it might help, right? Now there's some fun, there's some fundamentals that I might be able to say definitively, you know, like if you're sleep improved, well, even then, there's just no way to know precisely, right? There are too many factors. But anyway, so at first I'm like, oh, but then I thought, well, maybe he means that, well, no, I, don't, I never regret anything I say. And I don't worry about being wrong because if it's not quite right, I know we'll have a chance to talk about it, right? The client will come in and say, it didn't really work for me. And so, you know, I don't hesitate and I don't, I'm not worried. I, I, you know, I throw it out there knowing that we'll evaluate it over time. So I thought, well, maybe that's what he's talking about. But it almost sounds like he's saying he's never wrong. <laughs> Which Now, there's a possibility that literally every client he's ever worked with has benefited from him, and he literally has never been quote unquote wrong. I mean, how do we know what wrong is? How do we evaluate that in terms of psychotherapeutic advice, right? It's, it's hard to nail that down precisely. So there's a possibility that he's never been wrong, but it is well understood in our field that therapists and clinicians should, in fact, it's it's written in, to some extent, in a lot of our ethical codes that we don't say things like this. You could be sued over that, effectively, right? If something was deemed to be wrong or could be demonstrated to a court as wrong advice or unhelpful advice, and you're over there claiming that everything you do is 100% right, then you can, I think rightfully so, be sued for that, right? So I'm a little worried about this. This area, I'm, I, I always say, I'm just a regular person, nothing unusual except for this. 
I zoom in on you and I block out everything else. Since I was a little kid, people have always walked up to me and told me their problem. A little kid, I would be like 10 years old and a grown man would come up to I, Most of them I didn't even know and they just pour their hearts out. Yeah, I would say most therapists have that experience. I didn't have that as much as I think other people did, but I had a different kind of before therapist experience where there would be a lot of deep conversations that I, I would be at a party in high school and talking with someone and someone would come around the corner and try to join in in the conversation and they would stop and they'd say, wow, you guys are talking about some deep shit right now. And I, I'd say, oh, I, I guess we are. And so I think that's more along the lines of what I experienced as a pre-therapist, but a lot of therapists will experience this pre-therapy though, before becoming a therapist. They'll be like, yeah, in my family, I'd be walking along, I'd be in an Uber or a Lyft, and suddenly I'm hearing everyone's life story. And, and I'll even hear from some people that, especially once they become a therapist, that they don't like that. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I want to have a break from that, you know? But there's something about their vibe, their demeanor, their eye contact, their tone of voice maybe even the way they dress sometimes that really gives that impression to people subconsciously that they are a good listener and that they will listen and that people want to be heard. I don't know a single person who is satisfactorily heard on a daily basis. Everyone is walking around with a deficit of being truly listened to. And so when someone comes along that seems like maybe they'd be a good, li good listener, even if it's a stranger, like people take advantage of that because it's hard to find. When adversity comes, it's an opportunity for you to, at that moment, you're gonna face part X directly. Part X is the judgmental part of you. It's the antisocial part of you. It's an invisible force that wants to keep you from changing or growing. Yeah, so I don't know if I included it, but he said that early in life he developed this theory or this con conceptualization of psychology that the part X is the barrier to happiness or well-being or being who you are or something. And it coincides very well with humanistic thought, humanistic psychology thought. And I don't doubt that he came up with this when he was younger prior to learning. I'm sure he's learned about humanistic psychology. It's particularly for someone that came up when he did, it was talked about a lot, at least, at least he knew about it. I don't know how much he looked into it. But anyway, so yeah, as I've been saying throughout while I've been watching him, it's fine that he has this theory but I don't want anyone to think that it's unique to him. It's it, He has a unique way of describing it, but every therapist that has some level of sophistication has a unique way of describing things. I have my unique way of describing my integration of, of, of various theories that will coincide to some extent with other clinicians and theorists and experts, but but otherwise in, not, in ways that are kind of unique to me. And so that's what he's doing is, I don't know where he got these ideas precisely, but what he's describing is a very fundamental humanistic idea. Earlier I was talking about at the core of humanistic psychology and psychotherapy is this idea of that you have the ability to heal yourself. It's a complicated co concept. It's utilized in various different ways, some pseudoscientific, some sound. But it's this idea that we have well-being inside of us and that if we can access that, we will be able to lower our depression, lower our anxiety, have better relationships, blah, 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 all the things that people come to therapy for. So, for example, if you have a family that is in a lot of conflict and they have a lot of distance that uh, instead of seeing it as there's a pathology there that needs to be you know like a disease like the flu or cancer that has to be treated you actually say see it as well their inner goodness their inner health their innate ability to seek well-being must have a barrier to it so we have to remove that barrier we have to assume that health is within the individual and that the pathology is something that's extra on top of it right that's a different way of looking at things and it's a helpful way of looking at things often it's not always helpful but i i find it to be helpful myself and it's 
that's the core, that's the foundation of humanistic psychology. There's a lot of figures, a lot of theorists, a lot of authors over the past 70 years in humanistic psychology, and some go in this direction, some go in that direction, but for the most part, they all agree with this foundation, which is that we all have the ability to be healthy, and we don't start at a deficit. We start with strength. We start with wellness. We start with having a lot of aspects of ourselves that will assist us, and when we have problems in our life, it's because something was imposed on us. Often from the outside, maybe society, an idea gets on our head, a, an oppressive cultural notion or trauma or something. And if we address that and, and remove that or put it aside temporarily, then our inner ability to be healthy will emerge. So he's describing that. He's saying that part X is that oppressive barrier. Evolution, it wants to block your potential. It wants to fuck up your shit. So part X would be the villain in the story of being a person. And the tools are what the hero on the journey can use to fight the villain. Yes, part X is the voice of impossibility. Yeah, so pretty fundamental to humanistic psychology. Again, I, I, I say this not to demean him. <laughs> I, it might come across that, but I do want to bring, I, I want, I've been saying this throughout this series is that I want people to enjoy this documentary. My goal is for everyone you out there and for everyone you talk to, to have hope that therapy can help. And to also potentially be an informed consumer to know what kind of therapy is out there available so that you can seek that kind of therapy that might be helpful to you. And what I don't want to have happen is to have people watch this and think that he is unique, that he is one of a kind, because he's not fundamentally as far as I can tell, what I'm seeing so far, and it would be weird if he was one of a kind because there are thousands of us around the world. So the chance that our ideas are, especially if they work, if a th you know, like for example, when I started out, I primarily, I was only exposed to a smaller set of theories. As you know, in the bat, there are 400 plus major theories within psychotherapy. And so you can't learn all of them in graduate school. So of the ones that I was exposed to, the one that resonated with me the most was object relations theory, which is a offshoot of psychodynamic or a a subsection of psychodynamic theory. It's relationally based psychodynamic ideas. And that resonated with me. That started me on a journey to learn more about psychodynamic therapy, therapy in general, theory in general, psychoanalysis. And then I eventually started to, which introduced me to attachment theory, and then I started getting into that. And so I developed over time this way, and then through experience as well. I mean, that was a big part of it when I actually started interacting with clients and trying things out and seeing what worked and hearing back from them. And I learned a lot through that process and I developed a way of seeing people. And then when uh, emotion fo emotionally focused therapy came out, you might be familiar, Sue Johnson, uh, Les Greenberg, these individuals came out and it became more popular, especially in, in my field of systems theory. And I would learn about it and I would say, wow, that sounds a lot like what I developed kind of on my own. Um, now, I didn't invent it. I, it was an evolution from all the different theories that I had absorbed previously. You know, I, we stand on the shoulders of giants, object relations theorists, psychoanalytic theorists, John Bowlby, Mary Ainsworth, attachment theory, systems theory, and humanistic ideas as well, Irvin Yalom, Frankel, Carl Rogers, you know, all that was influencing me and what evolved in me was what I felt like was a cobbling together, but felt coherent to me. Then emotionally focused therapy comes out and I was like, oh, they came, they must have come from the same place. And they did. I actually, when you learn about the history of how that got developed, they, they emerged from a similar set of theories and it's, it's their version of it. You know, I, I don't call myself emotionally focused therapist. So there's a lot of that in our field. And what I want people to know is that for Phil Stutz, he has his own particular evolution of how he came up with his model. It's integrative. I don't know how he would frame it, but there are clear themes, very solid fundamental themes within certain schools of thought 
that he is representing. I don't know where he got them from exactly. He's saying one of them he got from when he was a kid, and that's fine. But I, I want people to understand this so that they understand the landscape of psychotherapy and don't believe that he's the only one out there that does this sort of thing, because there's a lot of therapy. If you're looking for someone like him, by the way, you would look for someone that's humanistic. If I, if I didn't know anything about him, I just heard the tagline, I would say, oh, he must advertise himself as a, as a humanistic psychotherapist who is very authentic in the now and incorporates a little bit of psychoanalysis, given that he talks about the unconscious and uses free association. I would also say that if you're looking for someone like him in particular, you might want to look for keywords like brief therapy or pragmatic. You might so if if I were if he were to ask me, how do I advertise myself so that people know who I am based on what we're seeing so far, I would say if especially if you're advertising yourself to other therapists and they know what these words mean, I would say that you're foundationally a humanistic psychotherapist with some psychoanalytic integrations and you tend to operate from a brief, pragmatic, tool-based model that involves assigning people ways of understanding and framing their experience that will help them in between sessions with cards. <laughs> That's how I would describe it. And there's probably thousands of other therapists that are very much in that zone of thought and of technique, but they probably describe it differently and they might have come from other directions, right? what you're capable of. And it, it creates this like primal fear in human beings. What does your part X say to you? It makes me feel like I'm wasting time. It tells me that I've invented all this stuff and the stuff is great, I'm very confident, but it'll never, it won't spread deeply enough into the culture. Yeah, so I, it's fine. It doesn't, I, I just, the fact that this is a public documentary is the concern of mine. For one particular therapist to have these thoughts, it probably doesn't matter that much. But for this documentary to propose that somehow he is unique and has unique, he has unique terms, but not unique ideas. Not that they're bad ideas, they're wonderful ideas. I use them as well. It's well proven by science that a lot of the things he's talking about are helpful models of therapy. But I worry that that's the point of this documentary is to somehow elevate this one individual therapist basically saying that everyone else is an idiot it's not explicitly being said but you could see someone walking away with that so how can people get rid of pardex you can't you can defeat him temporarily but he's always going to keep coming back so another technique that he is using is externalization within narrative therapy or I think even emotionally focused therapy uses this terminology as well. I know narrative therapy does, where you externalize something about the personality such that you divorce yourself from that mechanism or that pattern or something. Like a real common example that might be universal actually is we all have an inner voice that puts us down. A voice that says, you're an idiot, you're stupid, I can't believe you did that last night. Everyone knows you're a stupid person, you're never gonna succeed. We all have to some degree that voice in our mind. If we accept that that's real and that's or that's true and that's a part of ourself, then it feels different than if we externalize it. If we name it like part X, or if we name it part of the IFS, internal family systems, you know, we name it as a part of ourselves. Or what I do with clients is I will say, whose voice is that? Because often it's someone in their past, right? Oh, that was my dad. Okay, well, what do you want to call it? Because I feel like we should call it, this is me. And this, I'm not unique. Lots of other therapists do this exact same thing. So they say, okay, what do you want to call it? What, what name do you want to put to it? And clients will often because it's a big part of their lives, they'll, they'll think about it. They're like, well, I, I think I want to call it like the dark devil, or I want to call it my critical dad, or I want to call it Tim. <laughs> I mean, sometimes people just come up with something kind of jovial like that. What's his name? His name is Tim and uh, Monty Python, right? Anyway, so when you do that and you name it and you're, you're saying it's not of you, it's not me, that's saying that. It's something external to me. It's imposing itself on the me. Now, all of it is me, right? That voice isn't actually coming from the outside. It's from the inside. It's me telling me something, right? They're both me. But if we frame it as not me and we 
push ourselves away from it, then it feels less powerful, right? We are identifying as, no, 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 that is wrong. That's external. That's from the past. That's injected in me. The me, me, understands that that's not real, right? If you are telling yourself that you're stupid, it's easier to believe. If you're like, that voice is telling me I'm stupid once again, because we all understand that that voice kicks in when it seeks an opportunity. Another externalization that's really helpful is that people will use as the addict mind. People will be struggling with substance addiction and they will have an impulse to use, to relapse. And there are certain thought patterns like, ah, it's just one drink or, ah, what's the big deal? Ah, you deserve it. Ah, you're never going to get sober. You might as well just give up now. Those voices will creep in, these thoughts. And if you divorce yourself from it, externalize it, and say that is the addict mind, then you say, I'm not going to listen to you. Some people even create art around this. I had a friend who created an externalization that was her self-loathing part of herself. I think it was literally the devil. And she did alternative comics and she would draw herself and then she'd be having a good day and you know, you'd be reading the comic and she would be having a good time. Her boyfriend and her were getting along and then something would happen and then the, the demon would show up and say, oh, you're an idiot. Your boyfriend is cheating on you. Everyone knows it. So it was that kind of thing, but it was an externalization, right? Now it's complicated. There's a lot of nuances to this, but that's another part of what he's doing. Whether he came up with that on his own or he's influenced and he doesn't remember or he is explicitly following something that he was taught, I don't know. But he is in line with that thinking because the part X is a part of the self, but he's saying it's, it's this other thing that you have to live with and deal with, but it's not the you. And thus, it doesn't give it as much power as if you identify with it. That's why you have three aspects of reality that nobody gets to avoid. Pain, uncertainty, and constant work. I don't know, but I'm going to take a guess and say that this is in line with existential thought, existential therapy thought, which is firmly within, it's a subcategory of humanistic thought humanistic therapy. By the way, humanistic psychology, humanistic psychotherapy are different than humanism. Some people will think of them as the same. They're not. Uh, they're related, but they're not the same at all, really. So we're hearing there are three aspects of reality. I think what he's, we'll hear him, but I think what he's saying is you have to deal with the fact that there is pain, uncertainty, and constant work. You, you can't get away from it. You, you, have to, you have to accept that those are realities of life. Existential therapists will talk very similarly in, or in this exact way. So let's hear what he says. So those are things you're just going to have to live with no matter what. If it did work like that, if you could banish part X, then there'd be no further progress. So if this is a story, the main character needs hard acts, it needs the villain, because if the main character doesn't have to overcome a villain, there's no story. Right. I'll note that Jonah Hill will paraphrase always in a sense of a story, a hero's journey. And I don't know, but it could be reflective of his theater work, that there in his work in stories, <laughs> that they will off maybe he's even a screenwriter i don't know all right well that does it for that episode everyone out there please take care of yourself and take care of others because we all deserve it we really really do